Well, hello, everybody. Today, we have a great treat with us, uh, Dr. Randy Poe, who is the Executive Director of the North Kentucky Education Council, and also uh, recently retired after 37 years in education, and most recently is super, uh, Superintendent of Boone County Schools. So, Dr. Poe, thanks for sharing some of your time with me today. My pleasure. So, uh, Doctor, there's, you know, right now we're in the throes of the pandemic, and uh, one of the constant discussions is when are schools opening, and you deal with all the school superintendents, you deal with uh, national uh, levels of, of education. Um, there's got to be so many things going through superintendents' minds right now. How do you, how do you keep instruction going while keeping students safe? Uh, maybe you could walk through this for a moment or two and just what do you, what's going through the mindset of a school superintendent right now and in terms of their planning to, to uh, re-engage the students here over the coming year? Well, this is definitely unprecedented times for modern day superintendents. And I think one of the things that, the major thing that's going through their particular mind is the health and safety of the children and trying to reopen the schools. And that is a huge issue and it's not taken lightly. They are in daily contacts with their local health districts in the state and also their departments of education along with the governor's office. So each particular state and locality is going through multiple scenarios of planning. But the number one thing is the healthy is the health and, and, and safety of each particular child that's going to come back to school when they reopen. So right now, that, that final call, uh, district by district, is a superintendent decision, of course, in, in communication with their board. Um, can they move that by weeks, by uh, a month on their own, and, and maybe even though a neighboring district might be doing something different? Yes, basically in Kentucky, uh, at the end of the school year, the commissioner had uh, talked to the different superintendents to come up with three variations of a plan. Early reopening, traditional reopening, and then a late opening. And I think uh, based on the conversation that the governor had yesterday on his press release, is that you're now going to that late opening option. Uh, that he's asked the schools to look at uh, not starting before the third week in August to give us time to look at the rates of transmission and see whether they're going, if they continue to climb, it might be delayed later. If it levels off, then they can reopen with their plans that they had in place. So, and we want to talk about what new, once it's reopened, uh, that what, what does education look like if there are days that kids are at school or if they're at home and this hybrid version, and I know there's different terms we want to use, but before we get to that, the issue, um, once you were open, so if a school is open and kids are there, and we talk about infection rates, and so if a child becomes a, a, a positive to, for COVID, would that mean that those, in your mind that those students who would potentially be positive, that the classmates in that room would need to stay home for a two-week period, or how would that look, do you think? Well, you know, once again, that would be in the different plans of each particular school dealing with their local health districts. But the, the major consistency across that would be that, you know, with contact tracing, if the child tested positive, there would be quarantines that would be placed amongst the students and some of the staff if the staff came down. And then you would also have in your particular plans, uh, you know, testing for the staff and those others to make sure that they're negative before they could return to school. So I think the issue is, is re-imaging of schools in 2020 and beyond and what we're going through will totally be different than the traditional school setting that we're traditionally used for because there will be outbreaks and you have to plan on those. And some of the major plans is what cleaning equipment do you have and are you prepared to clean those equipments and, and in between settings, your buses, uh, you know, let's don't forget about our buses have to be cleaned in between runs and so forth. So you got to have the appropriate cleaning supplies. So if there's a breakdown in that chain of, of products to schools, there could be uh, NTI days, non-traditional instructional days thrown into some of that just because you don't have the appropriate PPE equipment to clean your buildings. What an uh, amazing amount of items that have to be accomplished just to get kids in, in the building one day. So to speak to that, once the kids are there, um, there's the idea of virtual learning uh, if they can't be there, but it sounds like there's this hybrid version going on. Uh, maybe walk through us with a little bit, what does this new model look like in terms of utilizing 
technology and virtual learning? And what does that look like from a superintendent's perspective and maybe even from a teacher's perspective today? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, there's not one version that's out there that would meet and say that we would cover all 18 districts in Northern Kentucky and the eight counties. But basically, uh, the Northern Kentucky Ed Council, along with the Northern Kentucky Co-op, is working on has been working on professional development in this virtual world in a transition. Multiple school districts over time has had virtual programs that they've offered, and those have really helped in a sounding board for our other teachers to transition to these non-traditional days as we've been moving forward. What do we learn from those? For example, multiple districts, there's been six to 800 students over the course of the last three years that have completed their high school diploma you know, through a virtual program. So we've learned from that and we've taken that into this blended model. What the spring did uh, kind of transitioned us from a, a plan of three to five years to three to five days in, in implementing that. And it's kind of like jumping in a pool. Some people jump in real quick and some people like to put their toes in and go in slowly. Well, COVID required us to jump in quick. And what the summer has allowed us to do is have meetings with our uh, teachers and our staff and see what worked the best and what did not work the best. Some districts, for example, last year had live learning throughout the entire day, and we found out that that was too much. So what we did is some schools uh, in some school districts then cut back to maybe four hours online of that six and a half hour day where uh, teachers would be in the Zoom rooms or Microsoft Team rooms or online, Google Hangout, multiple different platforms across the districts. And then there are proprietary forms of that too. Uh, some of your larger districts have some of the uh, same platforms that the universities use. So they may have used those particular platforms. Uh, so those lessons are posted online uh, and the interaction is done. And then office hours are kind of like, uh, you know, the traditional post-secondary that you would have where teachers would be online and students could ask those questions directly. And that the teachers would do the, um, you know, just the, the, the board work that they would normally do in the classroom explaining, uh, let's say, a math problem, they would do over the Google form. So that virtual blended learning has really taken shape. So I think what you're going to see moving forward is uh, a transitioning of schools, uh, non-traditional schedules moving forward. You could have alternate day schedules at some schools uh, with some students coming in, or you could have full-blown courses that are being offered uh, at school for those that, let's say, the tested positive for the antibody, so they don't have to be as concerned as much, and they could come in more often. Uh, you could see, it was what I'm seeing across the state, some school districts are, are having school Monday through Thursday, and then Friday is a day where it's a catch-up day uh, for those that's virtual or non-virtual to work in groups with teachers. So given the size of your district, also a lot, you know, uh, depends on what you can do with social distancing or not. It's amazing uh, when you think about this, uh, most of us who grew up in a mindset of, you know, it's this window of classes, you have a break here or two, you go to lunch and then you go home. It, it's That's been evolving correct. for years, right? Education has, even pre-COVID has been evolving to really fit yes. the, the district and the student, right? So on one yeah. hand, this has been an evolution. Yeah, we've, we've been preparing uh, for flexibility and choice within the public school system for several years. And that's some of the things that the Education Council helps lead with school districts, working with our post-secondary partners. On the, on the high school level, for example, we have multiple students that only come for a couple periods a day, and then they transition to either virtual programs or dual credit programs at the university. So what you're now seeing is that is transitioning from some of the, just the students that were excelling to the traditional students across the board. We have to realize in this time that virtual learning, just like traditional learning of, of, in a classroom, is not one size fits all for all students. So some students are actually excelling in this environment where other students are struggling. So what we have to do is focus on the social emotional learning needs of our children and our adults, because we're taking it that our adults, for example, it can just make this transitional change and not go through any particular stress. And that's what we were finding is the stress in teachers 
somewhat was even more than some of the stress in the students and also the stress in the parents because now they're juggling two types of situations. They're juggling the fact that they're being a parent uh, and they're, they're also being a teacher, a co-teacher. We used to always say in, in the district that in Boone, before I retired, that we were always, the teacher or the parent was the number one teacher and, the, and our teachers were their secondary teachers. Well, that is 100% true today in this COVID-19 situation that each parent, what we have to do is as districts, we gotta be reaching out to our parents and say, how can we help you help yourself as a parent through this situation also? So we've got now we've got to take into consideration the social emotional learning of our students, our staff and our parents and help them through this difficult time. And those are things that we were learning from teachers uh, uh, in the spring to change in the fall as we're going back. In the fall, the non-traditional learning should look a lot different than it did in the spring when we transitioned overnight. You know, it's one of the things and, and uh, the amount of recap of these challenges you've just given us is very uh, eye opening. But one of the things I think that COVID has, has shared with uh, proven to me and to so many, even especially those who have uh, kids at school today, man, do we not appreciate teachers enough with what they've had to go through? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I've had more people who've come to me and said, you know, I thought the teaching was okay and not that hard. And then they suddenly tried to do a little bit of this. Uh, at home learning uh, through the when the pandemic started up and they said dear lord yeah. I never knew how hard it would be well you know especially uh, at that elementary level when we sit there and we talk about you know you know I have a grandchild a grandchild in that and you know we're we're trying to help you know at home learning in that too and when you're dealing with one or two and you say my goodness what is putting 24 children that are nine or 10 year olds in one room and how they do it. So we, we, you know, you always take for granted sometimes things that, that you take for, uh, that's on, that's happening every particular day. But then when there's a disruption as we had, you come to appreciate some of the things that you've taken for granted over time. Indeed. Well, and again, on behalf of the community, I want to say thank you for your years of service and continued uh, selfless work with the Education Council and uh, and really we just the recap and update of what's really going through the mindset of a superintendent and going through the education system is really beneficial. I appreciate your, your time with me today. Well and I thank you for the opportunity and I and in closing I will just say to all the individuals listening that the superintendents do have a very difficult decision working with their board but the number one thing that they are doing is they're taking the health and well-being of the child in mind and making this difficult decision. The decisions won't be easy and you will, uh, there, some will be happy and some will not, as you know, as a, as a judge's executive running a county, uh, but they are taking that health. And if you ever have a question, they want you to call them. They wanna work through that and work with you so that the child is taken care of in the best possible way through this time. And then as we continue to move forward, things will continue to get better day by day. Well said. Well, thanks doctor for all the work you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you.